This conference will now be recorded. Welcome in everybody. On today's lecture, we're going to be talking about communication, different modes of communication, how we communicate on scene, as far as radio operations, and who we talk to during the progression of the call. There's a lot of different communication avenues that we look at when we are dealing with emergency scenes. It's not just communication between yourself and your partner or yourself and the patient, but there's a lot of different avenues that actually correlate to any given emergency medical services run. So first, let's talk about communication systems. Now, this is going to be specific to how we actually get notified in the event of an emergency, and then also how we communicate back to the 911 dispatch center. So first, our most powerful means are going to be our base stations. So these are a two-way radios that are at a fixed site. So within your fire station, within your EMS station, again, this is where you're going to get the most clear, concise dispatch communication because this is going to be the most powerful antenna that you can encounter. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna have mobile radios. So again, these are two-way radios used in a vehicle. So your fire trucks, your ambulances, you're gonna have these mobile radios that most often are in the front of the rig, and then also in the patient compartment area if you're dealing with an ambulance in which you can communicate to both the 911 dispatch center, and then when you are in route to the hospital, you can also communicate with a hospital dispatch center as well. Then we also have portable radios. Again, these are two-way radios. Uh, they are going to be handheld. They are going to give us the smallest amount of service that we have. So they do work extremely well depending on what area that we're in. Now, if you get out into a rural area, it might be a little bit more difficult because the radio antennas um, probably are going to be few and far between in comparison to a metro area. And then another disadvantage of this is portable radios, especially in concrete buildings, um, tend not to work very well, especially if you're down in the basement. Oftentimes you can't actually get out of that building because what we're doing when we're communicating, it goes from your portable radio to that radio antenna, and then that radio antenna is then going to broadcast it to that dispatch center. And that's how all of these two-way radios work. So because of that, oftentimes we're gonna see repeaters out there. So again, for that example, when we're dealing with a rural area, oftentimes there's, there's quite a few repeaters that are around these major radio antennas. And when they have to travel a long distance, that repeater is gonna take that message, take that transmission, and then it's gonna rebroadcast it um, over a higher decibel reading. And then, of course, we have cell phones. So cell phones are actually starting to become a requirement in all emergency vehicles. Sometimes you can't get uh, radio communication, but you might be able to get cell phone service in order to communicate with either the hospital, your medical director, or your dispatch center. Telemetry. So this is a different type of communication. So this isn't going to be verbal communication like we've been talking about with our base radios through our cell phones but this is going to be broadcasting EKGs and also our vital signs too. Specifically what it's going to be broadcasting is 12 leads and 4 leads. So 12 leads and 4 leads take multiple different pictures of the heart and based on that picture we can see if the patient's in the cardiac dysrhythmia or if there's a potential blockage within one of the blood vessels of the heart. So for your EMT scope of practice, you're not gonna be able to decipher different cardiac dysrhythmias or properly reading a four lead or a 12 lead. However, you can actually do that skill and then you can send it to the hospital where a cardiologist or an ER physician uh, is gonna be able to interpret what that cardiac rhythm looks like or whether there's an actual blockage in there which is super nice too, because if that patient does have a substantial cardiac issue going on, then that hospital and that cardiologist is ready to go as far as when you bring them in in the emergency room and they're gonna have those additional specialty care physicians right there ready to go. 
So here's an example of that base radio. So within any radio system, there's gonna be a bunch of different zones and a bunch of different channels. So most portable radios, you're looking at about 70 different channels so that you can communicate with basically whoever you need to communicate with. Uh, the reason why there's so many channels is in the event of an MCI or you're called into a different service area and you need to change zones, change channels, so you can talk to whatever organization that you're actually dealing with at that time. Next, looking at our portable radios, or our mobile radios, excuse me. So again, these are gonna be located inside of our ambulances, inside of our trucks, and they have all the same capabilities that we would see with the base radio station, but again, this is going to be broadcast from the antenna <clears throat> on our fire truck or on our ambulance in comparison to most stations have that very large antenna on top of their station where they can broadcast that. And then our portable radios. So handheld radios are great. A um, couple of different elements go into it as far as making sure that we're using them properly, which we'll get into in the next few slides. And then here's that example of the telemetry device. So again, with Bluetooth capabilities and our cardiac monitors, what we see on our cardiac monitor, we can take a picture of that and then via Bluetooth send it to whatever hospital that we're actually transporting to. So remember any 911 call that occurs, we have a couple of different common elements. We have an incident, whether it's medical or trauma, or something else. We have an individual calling 911. We have the dispatch center receiving that call. We have then the dispatch center paging us out, and then we go and route and render that care. So during that progression, we're going to see quite a bit of radio transmission going on. So on our end, first we get notified by that dispatch center for a call. So that dispatcher oftentimes is going to say, let's say we're Gold Cross Ambulance, we're Gold Cross 305 today. So 305, stand by for a medical, respond to 123 Main Street for a 56-year-old female experiencing abdominal pain. So oftentimes what they're going to give us is they're going to give us the address, they're going to give us the age, they're also going to give us the gender, and then they're all going to give us any specialty instructions that might have been transmitted during that 911 call. You know, for example, use the back door entrance or there's a large jar, dog in the in the backyard. Um, so depending on how that 911 call first came in, depends on how much information we're going to get right off the bat. So when somebody calls 911 and they report a cardiac arrest event or respiratory arrest event, or a chest pain, something that's going to trigger that 911 dispatcher saying that this is a critical call. We are going to get notified right away, and then that 911 dispatcher is going to continue to gather information. And then while we're en route, we actually might get additional information in regards to that call. But for now, we're just using a basic 911 element. So we're responding to 123 Main Street <clears throat> for a 56 year old female experiencing abdominal pain. Now, when we <clears throat> repeat back to the 911 dispatcher, we always want to put ourselves in route. So, dispatch, this is Gold Cross 305. We're en route to 123 Main Street for 56 year old female experiencing abdominal pain. So, this is what's referred to as closed loop communication, where if I receive an order or information, I'm going to repeat that information back to my sender so that that individual knows that I received that message, encoded it, decoded it, and then provided feedback, which we'll get into later too. <clears throat> that dispatcher is going to acknowledge that you're en route, and then they're going to go ahead and timestamp it for proper documentation. Once you arrive on scene, you're going to radio into a dispatch again, stating that you are now on scene. So dispatch from Gold Cross 305, we're on scene. You're going to go ahead and acknowledge that, dispatch copies, and then they're going to timestamp it for you again. 
<clears throat> now, depending on what service you're in, some services will require that you also provide an additional timestamp or additional communication stating when you have made patient contact. So after you arrived on scene, this is, let's say you're in New York and you might have to go a bunch of flight of stairs or you can't find that patient, what have you. Um, once you actually make patient contact, then you would radio in at this time. But you're gonna progress through the call. You're gonna get that patient loaded up into the ambulance. <clears throat> and then you are gonna go ahead and start transporting to the desired destination. So most of the time it's gonna be patient choice if they're alert and conscious or family choice. Um, where we run into an issue with that is if that patient's by themselves and they're unresponsive or they have an altered level of consciousness. And in that case, most of the time we're gonna go to the closest available facility that's capable of actually taking that patient. So I'm gonna radio into my dispatch. Dispatch from Gold Cross 305, we're transporting one patient to St. Luke's. That dispatch will then acknowledge and then provide a timestamp. At this time, when you are actually transporting the patient, you want to make sure and radio that hospital destination that you are en route, and then you're gonna give a preliminary pre-hospital radio report. And you're gonna kind of give guidance as far as what you have, and then that ER physician, that ER staff is gonna be ready for you when you do arrive at their destination. And we'll get into that in a few slides. So next, we're gonna arrive at our destination. <clears throat> so dispatch from Gold Cross 305, we're at St. Luke's or at destination. And again, they're gonna give you that timestamp. And once you have cleaned up your rig, put your stretcher back together and you're ready to go and ready for that next call, then you're gonna go ahead and provide information to dispatch stating that you're clear and available. And then they are gonna timestamp that and you might be going on a, another call very shortly. So as we can see, radio transmission is followed through in the event that you are working on an ambulance and you are actually transporting. But if you are a non-transport service, let's say you're a fire department that does not provide an ambulance, then your radio transmission throughout that call would end after that ambulance crew is transporting that patient. So you're gonna arrive on scene, you're gonna notify dispatch. Once that patient is loaded up in an ambulance and transporting, then your fire department non-transport unit will go ahead and radio in to dispatch saying, <clears throat> dispatch from engine one, we're clear and available. And then you're gonna be put back in service. So some principles of radio communication, adjust your volume properly so that you can hear them properly. Um, somebody who's got a radio on full blast, it's gonna be difficult because it can come in a little bit garbled with how loud it is, or if it's too soft, obvious reasons, it's gonna be difficult to hear. Reduce your background noise. And then also, if you're working as a team and you have multiple people with portable radios on, you're trying to communicate or you're trying to listen to a transmission coming in, it's always best practice to have one radio on when you are trying to receive a message and or transmit a message too, because you get quite a bit of feedback from multiple radios that are right next to each other. So when you go ahead and get ready to transmit your message, listen for a few seconds to make sure that nobody else is talking on that channel, especially if you're switching channels. So you're on your primary service channel, the channel that you actually talk to dispatch, and then you switch over to St. Luke's Hospital because you're gonna go ahead and give that pre-hospital radio report wait a couple of seconds and make sure nobody's currently using that channel. Because if you switch over and immediately key the mic, you're actually kicking off whoever's on there at that time. Press the talk button and then wait a second or two prior to speaking. Because most of the time when you press that talk button, it goes through a little data message system within the antennas and it's gonna give you like a a couple of beeps stating that, all right, now I'm ready to go, I can transmit your message. So if you press the talk button and immediately start talking, oftentimes whoever's on the other end 
is not going to get the few first few words of whatever you're trying to transmit. When we are speaking, speak about two to three inches away from that mic. That provides the most clear message through our radio system. Universal language for radio transmissions is always addressed them and then yourself. So I use this example quite a bit when I'm calling dispatch and I'm working on Gold Cross 305. I'm going to say dispatch from 305, not Gold Cross 305 to dispatch. <clears throat> So oftentimes, we are going to start to give a pre-hospital radio report or we need to get a hold of dispatch and they advise us to wait because they're going to be doing a bunch of different stuff that we can't actually see them doing. So if they advise you to stand by, just go ahead and wait and then eventually they'll get back to you. We also never use 10 codes, so don't use any codes. The 10 codes lost favor quite a few years ago. The only real organizations that still use 10 codes are law enforcement agencies. And this is a key element to it. Anybody with a scanner is going to be able to hear, hear you when you are providing radio transmissions. So uh, proper etiquette, mind your P's and your Q's. Think of basically being back in elementary school and you need to use G-rated language and communicate in a very professional manner because of this. Also, remember every radio transmission is recorded. As far as using yeses or noes, we don't do that because they, they get soapy when we actually use that during the radio transmission. So when you're using yeses and noes, use affirmative for yes, use negative for no. So our radio medical report. So this is what we're going to be providing. It's going to be referred to also as a radio pre-hospital report. So I'm going to call in a St. Luke's. So St. Luke's, this is Gold Cross 305. We're about 10 minutes out from your destination, transporting a 56-year-old female patient, chief complaint of abdominal pain. <clears throat> abdominal pain started about two hours ago rates it as an 8 out of 10. It's in her lower right quadrant, painful upon palpation. She does have a prior history of appendicitis. She is alert and oriented. Vital signs are as follows. Blood pressure 128 over 84, heart rate 96, respiratory rate 20, SpO2 96% on room air, and a blood sugar of 94. And then any pertinent findings, both positive and or negative. So I mentioned a positive pertinent finding where I said that lower right quadrant was tender upon palpation. Could also be, be negative too as far as something that I didn't find that I would most likely see. And then also any interventions given at this time. So patient is currently on two liters of oxygen. Um, or if you're an ALS unit, you could have given pain medications at that time, and then how they responded to those interventions. After you're done with your report, go ahead and ask St. Luke's, do you have any questions? And they're either going to ask you four questions or not, and then it's going to be the end of your medical report once that hospital goes ahead and clears. So for every patient, you're going to be given two reports. You're going to be given one while you're en route to that destination via radio, and then you're also going to be given a verbal handoff report. Um, this is going to be your transition of care or your care um, transferred to the RN or ER physician at this point. So you're going to arrive at your destination, introduce the patient because we should not be using names over the radio because again that scanner aspect. So hi, this is Linda been experiencing abdominal pain for the last two hours. Um, always err on the side of caution, because even though the ER staff most likely did get that full report from your radio transmission, this is your opportunity to give a little bit more in detail too. And then don't always estimate that they have received everything that you gave over that radio transmission. Any treatments and additional treatments that you provided while you were en route, and then any additional vital signs too. 
So always best practice when you do get ready to go ahead and transfer your patient from your stretcher to that ambulance bed, or excuse me, hospital bed, is wait for that ER staff to go ahead and make eye contact with you um, and actually start listening. So there's a lot of reportable events that occur within the healthcare setting because of bad communication and messages that weren't received. And this is a big one um, that we can try and fix as far as EMS providers go, is because when we get into that room, a lot of people are doing different things. You might have an RN who's setting up the computer, another one who's setting up to receive vital signs, the other one might be making the bed, what have you, and people are running around. And when you're doing multitasking, when you're trying to listen, uh, you lose about 80% of the verbal content that, that that is actually occurring. So this is something that they're starting to do in the hospitals. They say, uh, time out, everybody stops, and that's when that handoff report is actually given. So with team communication, this is a big one, communication with all team members, including your partner and any healthcare professionals, either on that scene or within the hospital setting. When you are doing that too, just make sure that you're being professional and being positive. Um, when you start using negative language, when you start getting on somebody's case about different aspects, that derails not only communication, but it also de derails your entire team aspect of what you're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is trying to provide the best possible patient care. Now with therapeutic communication, this goes a long way as far as patient care goes is providing proper communication and just being there for your patient um, really helps out as far as the treatment process goes. Most calls that come in through the 911 system that are marked EMS, 80% of those are gonna be classified as basic life support or basic emergency calls. A lot of them aren't even true emergencies at that point. So just providing that therapeutic communication, oftentimes you can you can fix or help a lot of the things that are actually going on at that scene at that point. So be professional, be personable. First thing is use eye contact when you are communicating with that person because you're developing your patient rapport at this time. Be aware of your body language, whether positive or negative. Now it's very easy to read somebody's body language and I don't know the exact statistic, but it's actually more communication happens via body language or what is not said in comparison is what is actually said. So if you're standoffish, your arms are crossed, you look pissed off, then that patient's not gonna trust you and it's gonna derail that patient rapport that we're trying to develop. Use common language. Don't assume people know medical terminology. So it's always best to just use plain language uh, when you are doing your patient assessments. Be honest with your patients too, never lie to them. Um, that can really derail your, your relationship that you are building with that patient. Now, certain aspects, certain characteristics of scenes, um, sometimes you want to use language or use things such as, I don't know, or we can't tell at this time, or that answer is going to have to be housed by a doctor, um, especially if you're dealing with severe trauma and that patient can't see different parts of their body. You might not want to tell them that their foot is hanging by a thread or something along those lines because you can create that, that patient to kind of go into an elevation as far as heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Use patient's proper name and then also ask them what they like to go by. So if somebody's name is, you know, Steven, do they prefer to go by Steve or Stevie? Listen and listen intently too. So nothing is more frustrating for a patient to have to repeat themselves over and over again with the same question. Or also when we're given handoff reports, it's very frustrating for a patient when Let's say I'm a fire department member on a non-transport service. I got there first. I provided an entire patient assessment. Now the ambulance shows up and I give them a verbal handoff report and give them all their findings. 
And what the first thing that that paramedic does is ask the same questions that, that I had already asked and then relayed to that um, healthcare provider. It's very frustrating for that patient and it also delays patient care as well. So what the communication process entails. So first, there's an encoding process. So this is gonna be formulating what I wanna say and then providing that communication to my receiver. That receiver, so I'm classified as a sender, the receiver is then gonna decode that message because everybody thinks differently. Um, we learned that as far as providing Lego instructions when we did do that lab. They have to decode that message as far as how they can understand it with how their brain system actually works. And then that sender is gonna provide feedback, or excuse me, that receiver is gonna provide feedback to the sender so that that sender understands that the receiver did receive the message and understands it clearly. Now, different responses. So I received that message <clears throat> from the sender. So there's gonna be a couple of different responses that <clears throat> I can utilize. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, clarification. So maybe I need that entire message reiterated or just parts of that message reiterated so that I can get proper clarification because maybe my, my decoding of that message wasn't quite right. I could also provide a summary. So this is gonna be a brief synopsis of what they told me. And again, it's using that closed loop communication so that we actually understand or that sender understands what the receiver got out of that message. Explanation, so this would be correlated more as far as a question answer type concept. Silence, that is also a, a mode of communication and it could be a mode that that individual wasn't listening or maybe that person is just a bad communicator and is not following up that message with anything but silence. And we also have a reflection, and reflection similar to summary, but reflecting upon maybe a question or maybe the scenario that they actually presented with. Empathy and sympathy. So empathy is gonna be understanding what somebody's feeling. So if you're receiving a message and they're saying, um, I'm depressed, I suffer from anxiety, you can go ahead and repeat, you know, I understand that you're feeling this way. So a lot of people get confused between what's the difference of empathy and sympathy. Empathy, again, is understanding what somebody's feeling. Sympathy is actually sharing those feelings. So if your patient is depressed, then you're depressed because you're sharing those feelings. Then confrontation, this is gonna be the worst way as far as the communication responses go because you're creating a negative atmosphere when you are dealing with that communication process. Facilitated communication. So this could be done with a translator. Um, maybe somebody isn't able to speak and they have sign language and maybe they have an interpreter there to provide that facilitated communication. And that does it for our communication lecture. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Thanks so much.